Well, hello there, friends and neighbors. This is your old field, your, um, your old friend Fred Field, coming at you from right down here in Tucson, Arizona. And I've got a subject for you today that I'd like you to start thinking about. That is, how did the square dance call get started? Who, where, why, when, and how did it come about? Of course, we all know that necessity is the mother of invention, so I think necessity will surely play a part in the story here. Now, you might say, well, nobody knows. I don't know. Maybe we'll never know. But I think I might die trying to find out. As you know, I've been using the internet, using some museums and libraries and archives to try to trace down every little piece of the puzzle about the old-time American square dance that happened out in the rural areas. And all of these little pieces will fit together like a dot matrix and give us the overall picture of what happened, including what happened in the development of calling. Now, calling has a certain rhyme and a rhythm. You know, uh, like here are some calls that I heard in West Virginia. Up that center and right straight back. Up that center and divide the world. The lady go G and the gent go ha. And everybody meet them on the right and the opposite by the left. And another clue is we have a lot of French words in our calls. We got the Alaman left with the old left hand. We got ladies do C and the gents go do and do si do with a little more do and uh, several other we got the ballonet and the moulinet and several other French terms so the fact that France was involved in a revolution like we had in in uh, around uh, 1790 and uh, we got friendly with the French um, after that, of course, we fought him in a war around Daniel Boone's time and George Washington, but later on, we got downright friendly with him in Thomas Jefferson's time, and uh, I believe they helped us in the War of 1812. Well, let's get into some specifics here now. You know, there were, back in these early days, there were uh, traveling itinerant uh, dancing masters, we call them. They were teachers, and they would go from place to place and set up classes for a week and then have uh, dances at night, or uh, maybe their classes would lead to a dance on the weekend, Friday or Saturday night, Sunday possibly. And they also wrote books. Eventually, they started publishing pamphlets and books, and they would write articles and place ads uh, ads in the newspapers, and that's how we find out about them. So it's possible, just possible, of course, these dancing masters knew what they were doing. They were professional teachers, and this was a career for them. This is a large part of what they did. And uh, so they knew the names of the figures, and the sequence of the figures that they were instructing about, but probably in their classes, as they were teaching people to memorize the sequences, they probably mentioned the, the names of the figures in their sequence. And so this might have been the beginning of calling, and this could have, could have happened in the 1700s. And so it's, they're just announcing the names. At first it was just the names, and some of those names were French, of the figures that the dancers were to be doing in the order that they were to be doing them with. And I've, I've found out that they, some of these dancing masters had a little, a little fiddle that they would place, uh, undersized fiddle that they would place right on their arm right up against their bicep, and then they could uh, play the fiddle tune, and their head was free to look around, and their, their jaw was free to, uh, to give the 
the names of the the figures out. So the idea there is they would they would teach the names of the figures and then they would prompt the dancers with the figure names. And so it's not exactly calling, but it could be a step and the on the direction that the that the calling happened. Now we do know that these dancing masters taught in the big cities, of course, where where the people that wanted to do quadrille dancing and minuet and uh, cotillon dancing were in the big cities. We know that the dancing masters went there, but we also know that in order to make a living, and because we do have some evidence, uh, they also went to small towns. They went to little communities, little colonies of people, little settlements, and they would uh, teach out there. And people out there in the small towns, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have the books and they didn't have the, uh, the uh, wherewithal, the education, the instruments in some cases, so that uh, they depended on this dancing master. So they'd bring the dancing master or he would come through their little area you know, way out in the country and then the idea here is that maybe they started imitating what he was doing because they didn't have the the written form so it, this was an oral tradition possibly the dancing master had his his class notes but he wouldn't leave those with anybody and so they would have to just remember and they would have to do the best they could to uh, teach other people or to to uh, have dances, continue to have a dance now and then on a special occasion. You know, those were uh, holidays like uh, Christmas and birthdays, Fourth of July, Thanksgiving. So in order to have the dances, possibly they imitated what the dancing master had done and they transmitted the the names of the figures at first and later they they developed into to calls which were a little bit more than just the dance names uh, and it's quite possible that 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 would have happened in the outlying areas now eventually we do get call books where the dance the dance figures are named in the book and then they're given a description and in some cases there are there are eventually then there are also calls these are called call books and uh, they're sometimes called quadrille books and so our first the the first ones uh, might have been out of France uh, in England and France uh, before that uh, Italy was kind of the center of dancing before all this but it shifted eventually over to England and then France got uh, became the center for dance and uh, so some of the first books were French but we got our first American call book uh, I'm finding that uh, here in this uh, in this book called the history of square dancing by S Foster Damon I'm finding in here that our first American call book was uh, the Clement Weeks book it published in 1783 I believe and then our next one was uh, in 1788. And then we had a whole bunch of them come out in uh, starting in 1794. Um, so at this point, the Americans were getting American call books written in English. That's important. Written in English. And they have the dance names so that you can prompt them and uh, and and eventually they got the sequence of of calls and uh, as we got more into the 1800s these these there were more of these books available and uh, a lot of people got them we know that they were brought out west with a lot of the the uh, people on the trails coming out west starting in the 1840s they had these call books and the idea here is a step further now you're going to call 
by reading right out of a book, reading the instructions to the dancers, and one one name that was frequent back in this time in the, around 1850 was uh, they it was referred to as calling off. So calling off was just like uh, a teamster loading a wagon. There was a job there. One of the people in the loading a wagon for commercial purposes they had a checklist and they would call off the items. Uh, they would make a checklist. They they had a shipping uh, shipping uh, uh, list. And, and one person would call off the items as they were either loaded or on the other end, they would call them off as they were unloaded. And uh, so it was, it was calling off. So what are they calling off of? Possibly they were calling off of one of these quadrille books that had the instructions in it. And uh, that's maybe why we, we, we refer to it as calling, announcing, prompting. Okay, now another theory that we might think about would be the poetry, uh, the poetry aspect coming in. Uh, as calls got elongated, calls got uh, a little bit more musical. They got they got uh, rhythmic and and uh, they followed the the fiddle tune. Um, so. Uh, the idea here is that that maybe the the calls got a, a, some of the elements of poetry in them. We know that they got the rhythms of poetry, uh, like instead of just saying "swing" or "swing your partner," "swing your corner." Eventually, they got to saying things like "swing your partner round and round," "swing them up and swing them down." So we have a meter rhythm and we have rhyming coming in here. So here's an idea. We also have very many poems. Poetry was big in the 1800s, in the early days. In fact, a lot of what, what you would do in school was you would memorize uh, long pieces and many of those were poems. And poems were being, uh, poems were being uh, printed and uh, well, we had poets, and they the poems were being printed in magazines, and books, and newspapers were printing, uh, and some of those eventually, once people started doing all this community dancing, uh, which we later started calling uh, square dancing, when they would do this community dancing, uh, it would be written. It would be written about in the papers and in the in the, there'd be newspaper articles. And eventually, there were there it was the dancing was incorporated into stories and uh, uh, fiction uh, pieces and chapters of books and things like that. And uh, then eventually, there were full uh, pieces or stories written just about the dancing. But at any rate, one of the first uh, aspects where instances where these uh, community dances would be written about would be in poems. And so I can make a jump there where when they're describing the dance and talking about the people in the dance and the, the place, the location and the clothing and the music, they would also start talking about the movements and they would start talk, giving the dance names and uh, I can see that putting the dance names and the description of the dancing into rhyme in a poem might have introduced the idea of calling in rhymed poetry. Now, another related thing to this is that there are very many fiddle tunes that are either include calling or uh, are very close to calling, like in Sugar in the Gourd. Uh, I met her on the road, she danced on the board, I tuned up my fiddle, played the Sugar in the Gourd. Sugar in the Gourd and you can't get it out. The way to get your sugar out is roll the gourd about. Well, that's a lot like uh, swing your partner round and round. Sugar in the Gourd and you can't get it out. Swing your partner up and down. The way to get sugar out is roll the gourd about. I could give you many, many examples. But 
pure tunes and in some cases got lyrics. A very good example that you'll be able to relate to is uh, the 8th of January was a fiddle tune first and then uh, um, what's his name? I'm drawing a name on his blank on a blank on his name right now. Uh, let's see, uh, the guy who wrote Tennessee Stud, he wrote the Battle of New Orleans where he's, he put he put the he put lyrics to the fiddle tune. Uh, in 1814 we took a little trip down in the mighty Mississippi Took a little bacon and took a little beans. Fought the bloody British down in the town of New Orleans. So we we can see that, uh, of course, that was much later. That was in about 1950-something when he uh, he put that together. He was a high school teacher, and he was trying to get the kids to be interested in uh, in history. But uh, that was, So that was after the fact. But we can see in that song uh, a very strong relation between... Uh, pure tune and then the lyrics of a tune and then the square dance calling and as a matter of fact the calling got uh, synchronized with the fiddle tunes so the calling that I mentioned before uh, let's see See now, dance around your partner and then around your corner swing your partner to the world and swing it along for the corner girl that that meter and of the of the the call uh, fits right in. It synchronizes with the the phrases of the fiddle tune in fours. One, two, three, four. Swing your partner around and around. One, two, three, four. Um, I I wanted to also mention in uh, with the idea of songs and poetry there. Are are uh, forms of African poetry that uh, use rhyming couplets, like the examples I just gave. Of course, now those wouldn't have been in the French language. Most likely, those would have been in the in African languages. Uh, however, the French did colonize in Africa, and. Uh, the French were involved in the in the shipping, I'm sure, of the of uh, Africans to the New World. Okay, uh, now with the uh, and slavery comes in here too. I said before we didn't have dancing masters at first. We eventually got American dancing masters that were born and bred, lived lived in America. Um, so that will could the the American dancing masters. Our teachers could also figure into the into the uh, development of calling, uh, because um, calling does seem to be an American phenomena uh, more than uh, other countries. Okay, now, but even before we had American dancing masters, there is a connection on the large plantations. If a plantation was large enough to have a stratified workforce. Um, one of the uh, responsibilities that some of the slaves were given was to produce the dances. Now, it wasn't the black people, it wasn't the African slaves doing the dancing. It was the white family and their friends and guests that were doing the dancing, but it was the slaves who were uh, playing the music, and so and this, this could have gone on for a couple of hundred years, so we're talking when calling might have evolved in this env environment of the plantation, uh, because the uh, the these these dances were were the French dances. They were all memorized dances, and the the white aristocracy memorized. They had they knew what to do in the dances. They just needed the music, and in some cases, the the black uh, leader of the orchestra would be able to announce the dance, the the dance at before it started. Uh, they would announce what the next dance was. And then uh, they would uh, sometimes prompt the uh, the dancers with a with a head nod, 
uh, of, and sometimes it would be a bow to uh, know when to uh, to start the figure, because they these uh, quad the parts of these quadrilles had little introductions, and the the slaves that were in the orchestra they they knew at least one of them knew uh, the uh, how the dance went with the music, and from seeing these dances over a lifetime, it's very conceivable that in the after uh, the the late night parties. We know that the slaves had frolics of the, their own. Uh, the slaves were encouraged to dance, and they performed jig dancing or clogging for the master, his family, friends, and their guests. They were encouraged to, to do the clogging, but uh, after hours at their, at their, in their own uh, areas or off in secret locations in the, the, uh, the, uh, the woods, they would have frolics of their own and uh, it's conceivable that uh, because the the slaves didn't know the the figures other than the the musicians musicians that were that were in charge of them uh, at the for the plantation then uh, they needed to be prompted or told what to do and uh, and it was easier rather than teaching everything would just be to tell them just to tell them verbally uh, how to uh, to do the next uh, what, what to do next and where to go who to dance with so uh, that, those are the most of my theories, and of course, the, the last of all is probably the one that's generally thought of is just uh, that we're back to the necessity uh, problem here. Um, you know, in this country, people were thrown together. Sometimes people say it's a melting pot, but in a way, it's more of a solid bowl because people kept, they tried to, to keep their own cultural identity and their own folk ways as much as possible. And in hard times and in, in uh, uh, lonely environments out in the middle of the boondocks, uh, you know, that was even more the case. You wanted to, you wanted to hold on to the old country, you know, whether, whether you were from Norway or Sweden or, or uh, Denmark or, or wherever you were from, you, you wanted to hold on to those old ways. And uh, so it was, the uh, United States was a solid bowl. And uh, a lot of the early colonies, you know, there were more than 13 colonies. There may have been 100 or more colonies. They were little settlements is another way of saying it. And uh, a lot of them were absorbed. Some of them uh, didn't last and others were uh, moved. But at, at any rate, you were, you were either living with or you were surrounded by uh, people from other cultures and that spoke other languages and so the calling was probably a way to 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 help uh, to uh, unify the the dancing and uh, some people were probably better than others at others at remembering what to do or just you know were were aggressive and uh, outward going enough to uh, to want to tell people what to do uh, and then uh, in the in the even before the California Gold Rush, we had the Oregon Trail and we had the Mormons coming out. We had people coming, starting to come to California even before the gold was out, was discovered, um, or rather announced. I think people knew about the gold, but uh, it wasn't announced uh, officially by the governor of California and later the, the president of the United States. That's what really got it booming in the in the uh, by the the uh, by 1849. Um, but before that, there were a lot of people coming out on the trails, and, and uh, they, were, they were mixing with people. And we know on all these trails, they would uh, put the wagon uh, covers down and dance on the, the white wagon covers to keep the dust from uh, uh, getting in, into their lungs. Um, and uh, so it's a case where uh, even after they got to Oregon and uh, places, other places like Utah and uh, California, they would um, they would have dances, and uh, the uh, we can't even begin to appreciate nowadays because we're so spoiled and we have so many uh, gizmos and gadgets, and uh, we've got TV and telephone and everything. But we we can't even imagine what it meant, what music meant, and what uh, dancing. You know, if you when you had a fiddle player and you had somebody that could could uh, remember how to uh, 
do the figures, then uh, oh my gosh, they it would even a even a simple dance like Virginia Reel or or uh, um, anything anything going would would just be tremendous when you could get together with people. They it was so good they would stay up they would stay up all night or uh, or more than one night they would they would go all week. Um, you've heard of uh, breaking up Christmas. Uh, so the invention is the mother necessity is the mother of invention so the invention happened because it let people do the dance in a more organized way if you had somebody telling you what to do that's all for this show <laughs>